How can we tell? Recording. It's on. But is there any way we can tell if there are there yeah. people? Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Participants are coming in. Let's wait just a few seconds. Give them a chance to get joined before we get started. I know you kind of slow down a little bit when people are just starting. <clears throat> Well, we're holding steady at 14. So maybe I'll just go ahead and get started and say welcome and thank you for joining our webinar and our uh, with Ben Goldfarb and his book Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. We have a few bits of business to take care of. First, this is the Friends of the Library annual meeting. And um, before I turn you over to them for a few minutes, um, we have we just want to give a couple quick reminders about stuff going on at the library. And we want to remind you that you can place holds on library materials and pick them up in the meeting room Monday through Thursday, 11 to 2 and Sunday 2 to 4. You can place the holds anytime and but those are the hours that you can pick them up. We also have a new book match service to give you personalized recommendations. And you can see more information about that on our website. And we encourage you to go to our website regularly to see what other programs and services we have going on. Um, and we wanna also let you know that you can ask questions. There'll be questions at the end. If you look at the bottom of your um, Zoom screen, there's a little Q&A place where you can submit a question, but it'll be at the end when we get to those. And we wanted to let you know that copies of the book Eager are available at the Lopez Bookshop for you to purchase. So now I'm going to turn you over to Barbara Orcutt, the president of the Friends of the Library. Thank you very much and welcome to everyone. Uh, you may recall that once a year we have to have an annual meeting for the Friends of the Library and this is the occasion that we've agreed to, to do that um, and we're delighted to be here. Um, I want to just say a few things about the year. It's been a rather unusual and extraordinary year. Um, first of all, I want to give a huge shout out to the staff. They have done an amazing job. Beth, Malia, Claudia, Ingrid, Sam and the subs, Peter, Cheyenne, and Noreen have made the library run, even though we have all sorts of things that are trying to interfere with it. They've dealt with the reorganization first after Lou's retirement, uh, which sort of took up the initial period of the, of the year, and then COVID hit, and they did an amazing job of pivoting to an online service. They, they provided resources, enrichment, and information in keeping with our mission statement and have done things like the Village Square broadcasts, book clubs online, concerts online, and now that we can open up a little bit, they have grab and go. And you may not know that they're doing a very innovative um, youth program, youth after school program, which is desperately needed in the community. So we're really, really grateful to having, I think, the best library staff in the world. Um, I also, <laughs> want to express my gratitude to the community of Lopez. You came out and supported the library levy and passed it, and that's made a huge difference for the library. You'll notice that the building got painted this year. There's a reason that those sorts of things happen. And I also want to thank the community for book donations and um, <laughs> appreciate that you are now not able to give book donations. Just hang on to them, and once we open up again and can do book sales again, we can accept books. But right now, don't pitch books in, <laughs> into the library chute or leave them in boxes on the door like zucchini. Um, wait until we are back in business again, because as you know, um, we haven't been able to have book sales. We have had some good things go on. Um, you are all, by the way, if you're tuning into this, you're a friend of the library. You're a member because you are attending library programs. But the library, uh, Friends of the Library uh, does have a board that runs uh, the, the business of the Friends. And we do have three new members this year. Uh, David Painter has joined us in 2019. And then just recently, Karen Eames and Fonz Wynan have joined us as well. 
and that will help us do what we do. Now, normally what we do is supplement the library's um, ability to put on programs by providing cash, cold hard cash, um, <laughs> and bodies. Um, and and the, the primary way we have earned money is book sales, the very popular July 4th book sale. We sell books at the ferry landing. We sell books in the library. Uh, we sell books any place we can sell books. Now that has been impacted this year. Um, normally we budget an income of about $10,000 to uh, have uh, from book sales to have to pay for programs like this one where we have authors come and speak to us. And we're very fortunate in being able to have all sorts of programs that the friends are able to support. Um, we can't do it without you. We need your donation in terms of time, uh, volunteering at the book sales. Many of you volunteer to do cashier or set up. And when we get back to doing do book sales, we'll sign you back up again. And this year, we're going to invite you to also donate. Um, there is a PayPal button on the library website, and we'd be delighted if you felt so inclined to give a donation in lieu of buying books at the July 4th book sale. But it will be back hopefully by next year. We'll see. So welcome to the meeting, and I hope you enjoy Ben. I hear he's a really good speaker. Thanks, Claudia. All right. Um, next up, we just have a little appreciation for Bob Buchholz, uh, one of our trustees. He served as a trustee for the Lopez Island Library for 15 years before retiring from trusteeship this June. In those 15 years, he helped the library through many transitions, including building additions and strategic plans. Throughout his tenure, he emphasized the value of patrons, the importance of libraries in the digital age, and the acquisition of aviation and history books. We will miss his musical and popular cultural references when he used to pop in to check in on us and his steady and calm leadership. This evening is dedicated to you, Bob. <laughs> Well, I'm here to introduce Ben, and um, I'll read a little bit about him so we can get to know him before his talk. Ben Goldfarb is a journalist, editor, and self-proclaimed beaver believer. His book, Eager, The Surprising <laughs> Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter, was the winner of the 2019 Penn E. O. Wilson Literary Science Award and named one of the best books of 2018 by the Washington Post. He is also the recipient of a 2019 Alicia Patterson Journalist Fellowship, though, through which he will be covering the global ecological impacts of roads. In 2020, he has contributed two articles to the National Parks Magazine, one covering the resurgence of sea otter populations in Glacier Bay, Alaska, hmm. and another about the triumphant return of pronghorn to Death Valley. His writing has appeared in The Atlantic, Science, The Washington Post, National Geographic, the New York Times, Orion Magazine, Mother Jones, and many other esteemed publications. His fiction has appeared in publications including Motherboard, Moss, and the Bellevue Literary Review. His nonfiction has been anthologized in the best American science and nature writing and Cosmic Outlaws Coming of Age at the End of Nature. He holds a Master's of Environmental Management from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Please join me in welcoming Ben Goldfarb. Thank you so much for that warm introduction and thanks to everybody out there for, for making time on a, uh, on a Friday night. Uh, let me just share my screen here. And uh, let's see, can I... Um, I just need this little top bar to go away. <laughs> Um, why isn't this working? Here. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, fantastic. Well, well, thank you all uh, again for, for having me uh, to, to speak. Um, and tonight I'll be talking about, about uh, my book, Eager, um, which, was, which was mentioned. And, uh, you know, I'll be talking a lot about sort of the, the notion of beavers as ecosystem engineers, you know, as, as these forces of kind of landscape 
creation and modification with their, their dams and ponds. But I think it's important to just, to just begin with a little bit of kind of intellectual groundwork. You know, what is a beaver? What are these, these animals uh, that, uh, that we care about so much, or at least I care about so much? Um, so beavers, of course, are rodents. They're North America's largest rodent. Uh, and they're, they're semi-aquatic, right? Which means they spend most of their life in and around water. And they've got all kinds of fantastic adaptations for this unique semi-aquatic lifestyle. They've got extraordinarily dense fur. So they've got as many individual hairs on a, a posted stamp size patch of skin uh, as we have on our entire heads. Uh, they have these kind of wonderful webbed duck-like hind feet. They're very agile, powerful swimmers. They can stay underwater for up to 15 minutes at a time. Uh, they've got a second set of transparent eyelids called nictitating membranes that act as goggles underwater, as well as a second set of lips uh, behind their front teeth that they can close like a, a valve uh, so they don't drown uh, while they're, they're dragging branches around. I think that's a really amazing adaptation. Uh, and then what's, what's a beaver's most iconic, recognizable feature? What makes a beaver a beaver? Well, the tail, of course, right? And the tail is this kind of wonderful multi-purpose uh, appendage. It's a, a kickstand when they're out of the water. Uh, it's a rudder while they're swimming. Uh, it's a, a fat storage device. They actually put on fat for the winter in their tails. Uh, and of course, it's, a, it's an alarm system. I'm sure that many of you, uh, you know, sitting, sitting in a beaver pond in the evening have heard the slap of a, a beaver's tail on the water. Uh, and they do that to warn other beavers that there are potential predators nearby. So the tail is really, uh, it serves all kinds of, all kinds of purposes. Uh, and then the other fabulous beaver teacher, of, beaver feature, of course, is their, their teeth. You can see in this picture, they've got, uh, you know, sort of their top and bottom incisors basically move together, uh, sort of filing each other down into these nice chisel-like points. Uh, and the teeth are orange because beavers actually sort of chemically fortify their teeth with iron that they derive from their food. Uh, and that's really important, of course, uh, when you spend your whole life cutting down trees, right? Uh, so beavers are entirely herbivorous. What they eat uh, is the, they don't eat the wood itself, they eat the cambium, which is kind of the inner layer of bark uh, on a tree. Uh, they're what scientists call choosy generalists. So they've got a few species of tree that they really prefer, uh, aspen, cottonwood, willow, but they'll eat, you know, most deciduous trees. Uh, they do tend to avoid conifers, although I've seen them, I've seen them take uh, western red cedar. Uh, out in western Washington where, where you all live. So they're, you know, they, they're, uh, yeah, they'll eat just about anything. They also eat all kinds of, you know, her herbaceous plants, green stuff like cattails, water lilies. I've seen them basically mow people's lawns for them. So they, they graze pretty happily, uh, but they don't eat any fish. That's, uh, that's a, a you know, common misconception, maybe. Entirely herbivorous. So of course, in addition to uh, eating the cambium, they also use the wood from the trees they cut down as construction material. Uh, and there are two basic types of beaver structure. The first is the, the lodge. That's kind of the fundamental beaver housing unit. Uh, and inside the lodge, you've got you know, two to as many as eight beavers, typically as a, you know, a standard colony. Uh, and that's the, the mother and father, the male and female, who, who generally mate for life. Uh, the newborn kits, the baby beavers, uh, the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds. So you've got three year classes of offspring all cohabitating together in the lodge. They're kind of cool cooperative breeders with sort of human-like family structures. Uh, and then during their second year, those two-year-old beavers will disperse out, you know, like teenagers uh, heading off for, for college or, or work. Uh, and you can sort of see in this picture, there are underwater tunnels that lead up and into the lodge. Uh, so the lodge is a, a, pretty, a pretty safe place to be. So of course, in addition to the, the lodge, you've got the dam, right? That's the other classic beaver structure. So why do beavers do this? Why do they, they perform this really unique behavior that has no real uh, analog in the animal kingdom? Well, a beaver on land uh, is a fat, slow, smelly, package of meat, right? Uh, they get eaten by wolves, cougars, bears, coyotes. Uh, so by building that dam and, and creating this nice impoundment of water, uh, they can basically expand and increase the size of their, their own habitat, their own shelter, right? So instead of having to walk over land to that good looking aspen tree and risk being eaten by a, a, a cougar along the way, they can swim to it instead. Uh, and be relatively safe. So the, the dam is really uh, about creating that, that shelter. 
And this is, uh, this is what happens to a, a beaver that spends too much time on land. This is a, uh, uh, the remains of a beaver in Minnesota. Um, this was eaten by a wolf and, you know, and wolves actually eat the entirety of the beaver, pelt, bones and all, and all that's left is, you know, is the mandible and the lower incisor. So you don't want to be a, a beaver on, on land is the, the takeaway. So beaver dams come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Uh, a typical beaver colony is building, you know, in some cases, uh, a, a dozen or more dams. And that's, you know, there's generally one big dam, the primary dam, and then a number of smaller secondary dams. Uh, here's a, you know, a little dam in Montana that's, uh, you know, probably three feet wide and a foot high. So, you know, a very modest structure, uh, but they do get quite a bit bigger, of course. Here's uh, a dam that I visited again in, in Minnesota uh, that's probably 15 feet tall and, you know, maybe six to 700 feet long. Uh, and is obviously the work of, of many generations of beavers, all adding their, their stick uh, over, the, over the decades. And, you know, of course, in addition to building these really impressive structures, you know, they, they're really savvy builders. You know, I often think that, uh, you know, if you, if you asked a, a human, you know, a, an engineer at the Army Corps to, uh, to place a dam uh, that, you know, would sort of minimize labor and maximize the impoundment, you know, they would put, they would put the dam in the exact same place that the beavers do, right? So here's another giant pond, uh, you know, probably, this is probably 300 acres or so formed by a single strategically placed dam at kind of the outflow of a, of a little, a little canyon. So they're really smart builders, I think, as well as, as well as hard workers. And the other really uh, neat thing that beavers do is that they're, they're really prolific canal diggers. You know, people, we, we talk about their building prowess, but not enough about their, their digging. But they excavate these amazing uh, canal networks that, again, you know, basically allow them to forage up in the forest uh, without leaving the water. Then they, can, then they can, you know, cut down a tree and float the tree uh, back, back down the canal to the, the main pond, uh, all without leaving the water. So, you know, in addition to being great, great uh, builders, they're also wonderful diggers, and that's a really important function in spreading water out uh, into the forest. And here's what it looks like when it all kind of comes together. This is a a, a beaver colony that uh, I came upon in Colorado. This is at about 12,000 feet up on the Continental Divide near Leadville. Uh, so, you know, they do really get way the heck up there. Uh, and you can just see that, you know, we're not for beavers building all of these, these linear structures here, these dams and these canals. Uh, you know, this string would just be a, you know, or this, this stream rather would just be a straight kind of string shooting through this valley. But because of all of those dams, you know, the water is being impounded in this valley. This is, you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons uh, all being held in this one little uh, kind of depression in, in the landscape. So beavers, of course, by building dams, uh, they're, they're maximizing their own habitat, but in the process, they're creating habitat for lots of other creatures as well, right? Beavers are what scientists call a keystone species. So in architecture, you know, the keystone is the top block in a stone arch. And if you pull that block, the whole arch crumbles. And likewise, beavers are disproportionately supporting entire aquatic ecosystems, right? We know that, you know, especially in the American West, water is life and any animal that can essentially create water uh, is really really valuable. So you know a few of the the many 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 species that benefit from beavers. Here's a, a great blue heron rookery uh, that I came upon in, in Wisconsin uh, at a, a beaver pond. Uh, moose of course you know these giant uh, semi-aquatic animals that uh, you know that really are very closely associated with, with beaver beaver ponds. Um, and here's a, a really a really cool one, I think. This is a, uh, so this is again in Minnesota. This is uh, a beaver complex. You can see here's the, here's the old beaver dam uh, and the, the dam breached, the beavers left, uh, the pond drained. So this kind of meadow is, uh, is basically the footprint uh, of, a, of an, old, an old beaver pond. And here's the lodge, of course. Uh, and after that pond drained, a pack of wolves actually moved into this lodge and raised their pups in the lodge. So that's beavers creating habitat for their direct predator. I think that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, of course, there, there's also, you know, frogs, salamanders, waterfowl, songbirds, kingfishers, uh, aquatic insects, all kinds of creatures uh, are benefiting from these kind of watery environments. Uh, obviously, a really important one here in the Northwest is, is salmonids, right? If you're uh, a juvenile steelhead, like this little guy, you don't want to live in the main stem of the river. You're just going to get blown downstream. You want to live in a, a deep pool or a side channel or a backwater or an eddy. You want that kind of complex, slow water refuge habitat that, uh, that beaver dams create. So 
this is you know a really important beneficiary uh, that really motivates a lot of the beaver restoration in the northwest is this this beaver salmon connection uh, of course you do hear from the occasional uh, fish biologist who says well wait a second we're trying to take dams out of rivers right now right not put more dams into rivers why would we want to you know impede fish migrations but of course a, a beaver dam is nothing like a human built concrete dam uh, you know fish have no problem uh, you know wriggling through the, the structure of the dam sometimes uh, traveling around it during periods of high flow uh, or even jumping over it um, you know this is here's a, a picture that I took in a, a stream uh, near Seattle uh, and here you can see the, uh, the, the beaver dam and on the upstream side here are the two freshly dug coho salmon nests so at least two fish had no problem getting past this uh, this beaver dam and of course you know beavers and salmon have been occupying the same landscapes for you know many many thousands or millions of years uh, and the, you know the evolutionary connection is so deep that it inspired my favorite bumper sticker which is that beavers taught salmon to jump right I think that that kind of gets at the gets at the connection nicely so of course, historically, uh, these, these beaver modified landscapes would have been much more prevalent than they are today. Uh, you know, we don't know how many, how many beavers occupied North America before European arrival, but you know, our best guess is up to 400 million beavers. Uh, you know, today we probably have, you know, 10 to 15 million. So they're not an endangered species, uh, but you know, they're a tiny fraction of their historic abundance. And you know, a lot of what I tried to do in writing this book was go through old uh, trappers journals, explorers diaries, railroad surveys, Native American histories, uh, you know, trying to get a sense for what a fully beavered landscape would have looked like. And, you know, here's a, a nice quote, I think, from uh, Meriwether Lewis of, of Lewis and Clark fame. This is, uh, well, this core of discovery was exploring the Missouri Basin in Montana. And uh, Lewis basically described, you know, seeing beaver dams uh, in every single stream and tributary of the Missouri River, you know, as far as the eye could see uh, up to the mountains. And in many places, the Corps of Discovery actually had to travel along the ridge lines. They couldn't even use the valleys because beavers had so thoroughly uh, in, impounded them. You know, you read accounts from explorers crossing the state of uh, the, what is today Indiana uh, and not finding a dry place to camp for a hundred miles because beavers had so thoroughly kind of wetted everything. So there's no question this was what this was once a, a much greener, bluer, wesher, wetter, lusher continent uh, than it is today. So that was in 1805 that Lewis and Clark saw all of those beaver dams. In 1843, John James Audubon, the, of course the famous painter of birds traveled the exact same landscape and he was actually painting mammals at that at that point and he was looking for uh, a beaver to paint and he couldn't find one in the entire Missouri basin the, the area where Lewis and Clark less than four decades earlier had seen beavers in every tributary so what happened to beavers in just 40 years or so what did they turn into well of course they turned into hats right uh, you know I think people hear the, the phrase beaver hat and they think of like a big furry Davy Crockett like thing but uh, in fact beaver hats were these kind of elegant Victorian top hats that were you know all the rage uh, back in back in Europe and uh, you know the trajectory of the fur trade is basically you know the first fur trappers and traders uh, arrive in the early 1600s in New England and basically set to exterminating beavers in every single river stream lake and, and pond they encounter uh, turning them into into uh, felt and basically sending them back to uh, back to the the old world, uh, and it's you know it's really hard to overstate the extent to which beavers were kind of a driver of early American history. You know, along with timber and cod, this was kind of the most important resource uh, that that Europeans found in North America. And really, every you know historical event prior to the Civil War has some kind of beaver connection, you know, the Revolutionary War, for example, one of the, the British offenses that angered the, the colonists was denying them access to trapping grounds west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, here's a, uh, I think this is really illustrative. This is a, a beaver coin that was minted by the Oregon Territory uh, in 1849, and that the value of one beaver coin was fixed to the value of one beaver pelt. So the entire economy uh, of the Oregon Territory, of the whole Northwest, operated on the, the pelt standard. I think that's a, a pretty amazing indicator of just how integral beavers were to, uh, to economies. And of course, I should add that, you know, it was, it was white fur trappers and traders who spread smallpox and many of the other diseases that uh, ravaged so many Native American tribes. So the kind of the story of the fur trade is really the story of early American history and all of its grandeur and, and tragedy. So in addition to being a hugely significant uh, 
historical event. The fur trade was it was a really devastating environmental event. You know, we don't we don't really think about the fur trade in the same terms as we think about you know the deforestation of New England or gold mining in California as kind of this really seminal form of destruction. But there's no question that it was. You know, when you when you trap out hundreds of millions of beavers, hundreds of millions of beaver dams break down, and hundreds of millions of acres of pond and wetland habitat is is lost. Uh, so what did that mean for animals like the boreal toad? You know, the boreal toad is uh, almost exclusively, is basically a beaver pond obligate in much of its range. You know, it only breeds uh, in, in beaver ponds. So what did it mean for the toad that, you know, we, we lost all of that, all of that beaver created spawning grounds? What did it mean for coho salmon or moose or wood ducks or cutthroat trout? You know, we'll never really know, uh, but there's no question this was a, a, a profoundly detrimental form of, of habitat loss. So fortunately, uh, by around the turn of the century, you know, we start to wise up and to recognize that, hey, these are actually uh, pretty important animals. You know, as Enos Mills, uh, a mentee of John Muir's put it, a live beaver is more valuable than a dead one. Uh, and slowly but surely, beavers begin to be reintroduced in much of their range in Washington, Oregon, Utah, California, uh, all, all start to kind of bring beavers back, mostly from Canadian stock, which is, you know, the only place you can find a beaver uh, by 1900 because they've been pretty much wiped out of the uh, entire lower 48. Uh, of course, the most famous beaver reintroduction was in, is in Idaho. Uh, maybe you guys have heard of this, this project. Um, this is in, uh, in 1948. Um, Idaho basically wanted to move some beavers into, the, into what is today uh, kind of the Frank Church Wilderness area. Uh, first, they tried relocating them back there on, on horseback. Obviously, the horses didn't, uh, didn't take that very well. Um, so the next bright idea was to airdrop them. You know, it's 1948. There are some kind of airplanes lying around, some surplus parachutes. And uh, this one Idaho fish and game biologist has the bright idea of basically making these specialized crates and, uh, and parachuting them uh, into the, into the backcountry. Uh, so in, in 1948, uh, they, they airdropped 76 beavers uh, into the, the, uh, the Idaho wilds. Uh, 75 of the beavers actually survived in the experience. One beaver, uh, unfortunately, escaped midair from the crate somehow and fell to his death, very sad. Uh, but the next year, when they flew back over this landscape, they, they found beavers in every single place that they'd, re that they'd released them. They found, you know, ponds and, and uh, wetlands. So this was actually a very successful beaver relocation project. Uh, no longer state of the art, of course, but uh, at, the, at the time, that was, uh, that was how it was done. So, you know, throughout the, throughout the 20th century, you've got, you've got beavers returning all over, all over North America. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that they're returning to a landscape that we've colonized in the meanwhile, right? You know, it turns out that, that beaver habitat and human habitat is kind of the same habitat. You know, we, we both like low gradient streams and these broad fertile floodplains. That's where beavers build their dams and that's where we build our, our, our roads, our rail lines, our towns, uh, our farms. And, uh, you know, I, I would argue that we're, you know, we're really the nuisance species more than, more than they are, but, uh, you know, there's no question that they can be challenging. Um, you know, here's a set of railroad tracks that I, I visited uh, in Massachusetts, um, you know, that beavers had, uh, had, had flooded pretty, pretty thoroughly. Uh, here's, I, I really like this picture. This is a, a house in, in New Mexico um, that, you know, you can see is very, very well flooded. And uh, here, what's cool, about, what's cool about this picture, I think, is that here you can, see, you can sort of see that beavers started their dam over, he, over here on the left side of the frame. They kind of dammed up to the, the base of the house. Then they incorporated the house in the dam and then they continued on the other side. So, you know, I wouldn't want to be that, that, uh, that landowner, but you have to kind of admire the ingenuity of the beavers in that instance. Uh, another very common beaver conflict is, is damming and road culverts. Uh, you know, if you're a beaver, of course, the road bed is, you know, the world's greatest dam and the culvert is kind of the leak in the dam and, you know, beavers hate leaks. Uh, that's their whole, their whole uh, reason for being is, you know, plugging leaks and, uh, and stopping water. Uh, so, you know, the water level rises, the road washes out, very expensive to, uh, to maintain. That's probably the most common um, cause of beaver conflicts in, in the United States. Uh, but they do cause more creative mischief. Here's a, a beaver that uh, broke into a, a dollar store in Maryland and was browsing the plastic Christmas tree rack when it was uh, apprehended by the authorities. So they cause all kinds of, all kinds of interesting trouble. Uh, of course, the, the way that uh, most of these conflicts are handled is by killing the offending beaver. 
you know, the, the U.S. government, the, the, the Department of Agriculture uh, kills around 20,000 beavers every year for causing problems. Private trappers kill uh, certainly tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands more. We don't really know. Um, and, you know, there's sort of an intuitive logic there, right? The beaver's causing a problem. Get the beaver out of there. Uh, but the problem is that, you know, when you kill those beavers, well, the problem is twofold. I mean, first, you're eliminating that good pond and wetland habitat that beavers create, but also you're just, you're just putting up a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, right? As long as the habitat is there, the beavers are always going to come back. Uh, so you start to wonder, maybe, well, maybe there are kind of more humane, ecologically sensible, and cost-effective ways uh, of, of coexisting with beavers. Uh, here's, a, I think this is kind of a nice illustration. This is in Colorado. Um, and, uh, and there I, I went to this, this reservoir and, and basically the land trust that manages this property, uh, you know, they didn't want beavers to cut down the, the native cottonwood trees. You know, they had these beautiful old cottonwoods that they wanted to protect. So they wrapped those in, in wire and then they left unprotected the non-native Siberian elm trees. So here's, you know, and they basically let the beavers cut those down for them. So that, that's invasive vegetation control using beavers. I think that's, that's pretty cool. So, you know, I, I personally, uh, I don't think that any beaver should ever be killed for cutting down a tree. That's just, you know, too easy a problem to solve uh, with, a little, with a little bit of wire. But, you know, many thousands are uh, killed for, you know, cutting down people's orchards, for example, in, in central Washington. But I think we should put a stop to that. Uh, you know, flooding is, is kind of, a, you know, potentially a harder problem to solve, but there too, we've got lots of options, right? This is, uh, you know, a flow device. This, this model is known as a beaver deceiver. And, you know, it's basically a pipe and fence system that drains a beaver pond to a desirable level. So you basically, you pass this pipe, you know, through the road culvert or through the beaver dam. Uh, the fences are there to keep the beavers from plugging up those pipe entrances because they will do that. Uh, and you're basically creating a leak, right? You're moving water from the upstream side to the downstream side uh, and draining that beaver pond to a level where you know, there's enough water for the beavers to be happy, but you know, the water is no longer flooding the road or your farm or your driveway or, or what have you. So it's basically a kind of a way of striking a compromise uh, between beavers and people. Uh, another option when beavers are causing problems is, is relocating the beavers. And, you know, I think that, you know, that you, you may not realize um, that you all live in the best beaver relocation state in the country, but it's true. Washington actually has the, the best, most progressive beaver laws uh, out, out there that sort of permit um, lots of beaver relocation, uh, whereas a state like California, for example, it's basically impossible to, uh, to live trap and move a beaver. Uh, you, have to, you have to kill them. Um, so good for, good for Washington for, for doing that. And there are lots of, lots of projects, you know, in Spokane, where I live, uh, there's the Lands Council, is a, you know, moves a lot of beavers. Uh, in, in central Washington, the Metau Beaver Project, uh, you know, native tribes uh, are very into the Tulalip, the Cowlitz, the Yakima. Um, so there's really a lot, of, a lot of beaver relocation, taking beavers from places where they're, you know, kind of undesirable and putting them in places where we, you know, we don't have them and want to get them back. And uh, here's, here's Sandy and Chomper. Uh, to two beavers uh, bound for a new home in the in the Metau Valley. So this is kind of a, a happy story. Now the one the one issue with beaver relocation, of course, is that when you move beavers into a new habitat, you know they don't yet have their their lodge and dam set up, right? So they're very vulnerable to predation, and uh, you know a lot of relocated beavers get eaten pretty quickly. So you know what what some projects do now is they basically build these kind of artificial beaver lodges that the beavers can move into until they're ready to construct their own dams and lodges. So here's, I think this is a, a cute picture. This is a, uh, a, a, a beaver somewhere in the Cascades. I forget, I forget where this was, but uh, a beaver uh, acclimating to, to his, new, his new starter lodge. And uh, in some cases, you can actually build, build a, a dam for them as well, right? And create that nice deep pool of water uh, in which they can feel safe. Here's a, a beaver dam analog is what these kinds of human built beaver dams are, are known as and you know they're being used all over the, uh, the American West uh, in places uh, where we want to get back beavers and need to give them a, a little bit of help. Um, so this is a you know a very kind of low tech low cost way of uh, basically prepping the ground uh, for the return of beavers. Uh, broken hands or fingers or kind of the, the one hazard with this, uh, this, this technique. Gotta, gotta watch out that, that sledgehammer. 
So, you know, a question you may be, you may be asking yourself right now is, is why go to all this trouble, right? I, you know, I mentioned some of the, the other species that, that benefit from, uh, from beaver ponds and wetlands, but what do beavers do for us humans that, uh, that, that makes them valuable? You know, not, not that that's a, you know, the sole measure of a species, of course, but, you know, it is a kind of a helpful argument uh, to be able to make on their, on their behalf. So what do beavers do um, that's, that's so helpful for us? Well, I think that, you know, the biggest thing in the, in the American West, of course, we live in this very kind of, well, maybe not you on the West side so much, but, uh, you know, here on the East side, um, you know, it's, it's a very, we're a very arid environment, right? And, and beavers are the kind of these incredible agents of, of water storage and creation, right? They're building these amazing little reservoirs. Uh, here, I think, is a really nice example from Nevada. Um, this is a stream in Northeast Nevada that was, you know, as you can see, was very degraded um, by, you know, a century of, of uh, beaver trapping and, and overgrazing. Uh, and in this case, you know, the kind of the, the local ranchers and uh, the Bureau of Land Management basically worked together uh, to, you know, prevent the cattle on this, this um, parcel of land from overgrazing those, those, those stream beds uh, and basically let the vegetation recover a little bit, let some of the, you know, the cattails and willow regrow and uh, almost magically beavers found their way back into this habitat. Nobody released them, they just kind of, you know, they've got this sort of incredible way of just finding uh, an available niche. So this picture, again, this was taken in 1980. The next slide I'm gonna show you is the exact same stream in the exact same place, more or less in 2017 after you know about 20 years or so uh, of, of managed grazing and beaver recovery. So keep this picture in your mind and then check out this. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, so you know of course you could you could look at this and you, know, you might look at, look at this and say well wait a second I don't see any beavers here what are the beavers doing? Um, but all of this kind of cattail growth is actually growth atop an old beaver dam so they're really sort of deeply embedded in this ecosystem. Uh, and you know, you can just look at this and say, well, clearly this is a, you know, a healthier landscape than this one. Um, but you know, some, some of these benefits were also quantified. So we saw 20 more acres of open water, thanks to beavers, right? Beavers building dams, creating ponds, making these amazing little you know, holes for, uh, for waterfowl and herons and, and uh, cutthroat trout, all kinds of critters. Uh, beavers actually added three miles to the wetted stream lane. So what does that mean? Well, that stream was so degraded, it was actually going dry before reaching its confluence with the main stem river. So by building dams and slowing that water down, beavers made sure that there would still be water in the creek in you know, August and September, the, the hot, dry season. So they're not, you know, they're not stealing the water as some farmers allege, they're just slowing that water down and, uh, you know, and kind of making sure there's still, still water in the stream late in the season. Uh, they also saw a two foot increase in the water table. So what does that mean? Well, in a beaver pond, you know, there's all of this visible surface water you can see. But what you don't see is the, the weight of that pond, you know, forcing itself, forcing water into the ground, recharging aquifers, rehydrating soils, raising that water table. I think that's pretty cool. And the, upsh the upshot of that uh, is that beavers are basically irrigating these vast valleys, right? They're amazing irrigators. Uh, and, you know, and beavers produced a hundred more acres of riparian or streamside vegetation, again, by, by hydrating that soil. That's a big deal for this guy. This is James Rogers. He's one of the, the ranchers on this grazing allotment. And uh, you know, he pointed out to me that beavers basically created a, a tenfold grass production increase for him, right? By irrigating all of that, all of that forage for his cows. So that means you know, more weight on his cattle, more money in his back pocket. So you know, in Northeast Nevada now, there's this really kind of wonderful progressive cluster of ranchers who support beavers because they've experienced the benefits. Uh, another fabulous beaver benefit is that they're great, you know, pollution capture devices, right? They, you know, uh, when the, the stream kind of reaches the, the dam, you know, the water slows down and everything that that water column is carrying, all of the suspended sediments and pollutants, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, heavy metals from historic mining, you know, basically settles out of the water column as the water slows down. Uh, so here's, you know, I think this is a nice illustration of this phenomenon. This is in Colorado. Um, you know, and you can just see this incredible kind of cake of, uh, of, of sediment that has been stored behind this, this beaver dam. Uh, and uh, researchers have found that just a single pair of beavers uh, was capable of capturing 100 tons of sediment, uh, 15 tons of carbon. So they're sequestering huge amounts of carbon uh, in these, you know, in these, in these sites and a ton of nitrogen. So now beavers, you know, in, in Chesapeake Bay, uh, they're being used as, as kind of 
agricultural pollution remediation uh, you know, apparatuses. Um, so that, that pollution capture function is, is really important. Uh, another fabulous thing that beavers do is they slow down floods, right? So they, so they help us fight drought by storing water, but they also fight the reverse of drought, floods, by, you know, by building dams, by spreading water out, by sinking into the ground. They're, they're capturing huge amounts of water and basically preventing destructive floods from, you know, racing downstream and damaging property. So here's a, a beaver, a beaver complex in Scotland, uh, you know, in England and Scotland, the Eurasian beaver, kind of a sister species to our North American beaver, has been, has been reintroduced recently, primarily for this, this flood fighting benefit. So that's kind of the incredible thing about beavers is that they're, they're tackling both drought and flood. They're just taking, you know, these extremes uh, in precipitation and runoff and, and basically, you know, leveling them out. That's a, a really amazing thing about beavers, I think. And then, you know, the, the final thing that's just so important, uh, of course, right, right now, it's all top of mind for us, is that they're, they're amazing firefighters. And, you know, there's some, some really wonderful new research basically, basically proving that beavers create these fire refugia, right? So as a big wildfire is raging, you know, the only green, wet, blue, lush place in the landscape left is that, that beaver irrigated valley bottom. So all of the, you know, all of the creatures uh, in, in this burnt ecosystem can kind of retreat to that, that beaver created shelter uh, and then recolonize the landscape uh, after that, that fire has, has burned over. So this, this notion that beavers can create fire refugia and even fire breaks in some cases, actually stopping the spread of fire altogether uh, is a really, exciting, promising line of research that uh, many scientists are, are studying right now. So given all of these wonderful beaver benefits, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're asking yourself, well, why aren't beavers a, a more beloved and, and accepted creature? You know, why do we still kill so many of them? And I, you know, I think that part of the issue is we have this kind of historical, ecological amnesia. You know, when, when we wiped out several hundred million beavers. We also wiped out the landscapes they created and we, we kind of internalized this notion of a degraded stream as a natural one. You know, we, we sort of, um, yeah, we came to envision a healthy stream being a straight, free-flowing, gravel-bottomed, narrow little brook, you know, that you could, you could go fishing in. Uh, and, you know, I love, love those kinds of streams. I go, I go fishing in them too. But, you know, it's probably true that, that most of our, our aquatic ecosystems looked more like this uh, historically, thanks to beavers, right? They were, you know, they were these slow, sprawling, muddy swamps, uh, you know, full of dead and dying trees and decomposing matter. And, uh, you know, those aren't the kinds of landscapes that we, that we picture today as being healthy and natural and normal. Uh, but historically, they would have been, you know, probably more uh, rule than, than exception. So I think that to, to fully embrace beavers on our landscapes, we have to reconfigure our historical imaginations uh, and, and you know, recognize that these, these kinds of beaver created ecosystems are, are actually uh, healthy, natural, normal, and, and vital. So to sum it all up, you know, we get this, this amazing animal uh, that performs all of these valuable services for us doesn't for free and uh, doesn't require permits. That's the, that's the best part of all. So as, as the mantra of the beaver believer goes, I think it's time that we step back and uh, let the rodent do the work. So with that, I'll say uh, thank you guys so much for, for your, uh, your attention tonight. Um, feel free to shoot me an email anytime if you wanna share your beaver story. Um, I can also send you a, a, a signed copy of the book uh, if you're interested. So there's my, my email address in the uh, bottom left corner. And um, yeah, at this point, I think we can just take some, uh, take some questions. Um, buddy, can you, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. It looks like we have some questions in chat and one, two questions in the Q and A section. Okay. Um, I'll take, I'll take a look. Let's see. Um, okay. So one question is how many kinds of beavers are there? Uh, so there are two kinds of beavers. There's the, the Eurasian beaver, which lives in Europe and Asia. Uh, that's castor fiber is the Latin. 
and uh, then there's Castor canadensis, the, the North American beaver, uh, which lives, of course, in North America. Um, and, you know, historically, I mean, millions of years ago, there were many kinds of beavers. There were, you know, there was one species of beaver uh, that basically, was, you know, it was sort of like, the, like a prairie dog, basically, that dug these incredible giant hel helical burrows into the ground. Um, there, were, there was, you know, a beaver the size of a black bear that lived, uh, you know, in, across much of the eastern United States. So, you know, historically we had lots of beaver diversity, but now we're just the, the two species, the Eurasian and the, and the North American. Um, let's see, where, oh, what, what beaver predators live in, in Washington state? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. So we've got, of course, wolves. Um, wolves, you know, wolves love beavers. Wolves are really, really big beaver predators. And beavers are actually a really important food source for wolves. You know, we, we think of wolves as being these kind of, chase predators that, you know, run down uh, elk, and, elk and deer. But uh, in, in summer, especially, you know, beavers are real, a really important food source for wolves. And, and wolves are actually, they'll actually ambush them. They'll kind of post up next to beaver canals and foraging trails and wait for the beaver to pass by on its, its nightly rounds and then just pluck them out. Um, so, so wolves are a big one. Cougars eat a lot of beavers. Uh, black bears, coyotes. Yeah, those are the, those are the big ones. Um, let's see. Would you comment on beavers as an invasive species, e.g. Terra del Fuego? That's a really good question. So uh, in the 1940s, um, uh, a little population of North American beavers was established in Terra del Fuego at the kind of the southern tip of South America uh, and basically went crazy. Uh, you know, the point was to establish a fur trade. Uh, the fur trade never took off, but the, the beavers definitely took off. And, uh, you know, the kind of the interesting thing that's happened there is that beavers have, have caused a lot of damage. Uh, you know, they've, <clears throat> they've cut down a lot of trees. They've kind of like flooded these amazing uh, old growth beach forests. And, uh, you know, they're considered this, this kind of devastating nuisance. And they're now spreading north uh, up South America uh, in, in Argentina and, and Chile. And, uh, you know, there's a, a plan to, you know, try to eradicate 100,000 of them. Um, which will probably probably not work. <laughs> um, so you know, to me, I mean, I think what's interesting about that is that, you know, what that illustrates to me is is how deeply adapted certain ecosystems are to beavers, right? I mean, if you think about our, our trees here in North America. You know, if you cut down a willow tree, it it coppices, right? It sends out you know sprouts. I mean, why does it do that? Because it's it's adapted to to beaver chewing. You know why is why are our alder, uh, you know, so adapted to wet soils because they you know they evolved in this in this kind of beaver rich ecosystem, whereas in South America, you know the the the, the beech trees, the native beech trees down there, don't have any kind of history of of you know beaver coevolution, of course. Uh, so they're not they're not you know they're very susceptible to being to being killed by beavers. So you know it's there's no question that beavers are are a big problem in South America, um, but you know in some ways I think it just illustrates how deeply ingrained they are in their native North American ecosystem. Um, let's see, uh, are there or have there been beavers in the San Juan Islands? Yeah, there, there are, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know the San Juans uh, super well, but I know that, you know, that there, there have been beavers uh, est established there. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you where to go see them, um, but you know, they, they, do, they do utilize salt water, they, they disperse uh, in the ocean. Um, from the mainland to islands, and I, I know they've done that in, in the San Juan. So again, I'm not sure where to see a beaver in the San Juan Islands, but I, I, know, I know that it is possible. Um, let's see, Karen asked if I know what kind of beaver research and attention is being undertaken in, uh, in Colorado and the, the arid west. Um, yeah, all kinds of fantastic beaver research. Uh, you know, the book, I mean, actually, that's what the book's, the book's about, basically, are all these different, you know, beaver, um, study and restoration projects uh, happening all over all over the, the American West for all kinds of reasons. Uh, you know, you, you said that you live, you live at, down the Arkansas Valley, um, so uh, Salida uh, would be the, the place to go. There are a couple of, uh, a couple of projects there um, involving beaver restoration. And check out the, I believe that the Central Colorado Conservancy uh, is doing some really, some really great beaver work. And I, I visited there a couple of years ago and they took me on a, a beaver tour. So check out, yeah, check out the Central Colorado Conservancy. Um, we'll have some good, um, some good info for you. Uh, and then, um, yeah, uh, would beaver overrun us here like rabbits and deer? Um, that's a, a good, a good question. You know, do beavers kind of take off 
uh, and, and, you know, explode. And, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, certainly not. I mean, obviously they're, I mean, first they're just, they're just confined to, you know, certain kinds of streams, right? Uh, they can't, you know, unlike a deer rabbit, they can't live everywhere. They have to live in, you know, in a pond or a lake or a, or a, a creek. Uh, so their habitat is kind of naturally limited. Um, and, you know, again, they're, I mean, they're, they're, um, you know that I mean that 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 available habitat really determines the size of the population. You know they're very self-regulating like that. Uh, they don't actually need predators to control the population. It's you know it's really about how much available habitat there is there is for them. And uh, you know again because they're because they can't live everywhere. Uh, you know their extent is is going to be kind of naturally uh, restricted. Um, let's see. I, so I think that that might be everybody. Is there, are, is there anything else that I, that I missed there, Claudia? I think we had, um, a couple of questions. Well, Ingrid and I did as well. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. And one of them was, uh, um, are beavers found in all parts of the world? Yeah, so they're, so, uh, they're not. Um, so, you know, our beaver, the North American beaver is basically found from, you know, kind of Northern Mexico, uh, to the, you know, the, the tundra line um, in, the, in the Arctic. So, you know, they're pretty widely distributed uh, in North America. Uh, there, there are beavers in every state but Hawaii. Uh, so they're, you know, they're all over the place. Um, and then that, that Eurasian species, um, you know, they're all there. Historically, they would, they would have been, you know, distributed from, you know, Western Europe to the, the Korean Peninsula, really across the, you know, the entirety uh, of the continent. They've been mostly you know, again, yeah, mostly wiped out in Asia. There are some beaver populations in China and uh, and now Mongolia, um, and there are also beavers uh, all over Western Europe, um, and certainly you know Central and Eastern Europe have have big po have big populations as well. Now I think there are about three million beavers uh, in in Europe and Asia at the at the moment. So they've they've made a really wonderful comeback uh, there as well. Um, yeah, Germany, France uh, have you know very large beaver populations. All of the all of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, beavers were just um, found their way back into Italy last year. That was very exciting. So they're, um, yeah, they're kind of gradually uh, occupying much of their historical range, which is great. Are there great, are there some good places to go to see in Washington to see sort of beaver habitats or are there any sort of beaver tourism guides like where you can go to see some great beaver stuff? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So um, I would say the, the close, you know, the best the, the, the closest thing to a tourism guide near you guys um, is there's a, a, a Whatcom County beaver group. Um, I forget what they're called, but if you, if you just Google Whatcom County beaver group, um, you'll, find, you'll find them. And they, I believe they actually, they actually have a, a nice little kind of, you know, Google Earth map with pins um, where, where, you'll see, you're, where you'll see beaver activity. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and then, and then Seattle is also there, you know, there, there are beavers in Seattle too. They're all over the place in Seattle, you know, um, Golden Gardens and, and Ballard. Um, that's, uh, there's a beaver population there. Um, yeah, Seattle is, you know, it's like one of the, the, the more beavery uh, large cities in the, in the world, I would say. So lots of, lots of good opportunities. But yeah, but check out that, that Whatcom County beaver group. They, they'll have your, they'll have your answers. Yeah, great. Well, looks like we've answered some questions over in the Q and A. And would you tell us the name also of the? Because I really want to impress my children later when I get home. Of the part of the tree that they eat again, and what is yeah. that instead of? Right, it's the it's the cambium. Uh, that's C A M B I U M, and that's again that's kind of the inner layer of of bark. That's the nice kind of sugary good stuff that that you know when the tree grows, that's what's really growing is that that inner bark. And then, do you have any further um, kind of resources that you recommend? We have the book in the library. Of course, it's checked out right when we want to show it. It's gone. Uh, we have some other um, on the island at the bookstore did open, uh, order some other copies. But are there any resources, even films or documentaries that would be great for people who are interested for us to acquire? Yeah, you know, there's, uh, the, so there's, there's a, a wonderful documentary called, called The Beaver Believers. Um, I'm not sure if that's, I, it just came out a year or two ago, so it's, you know, it, it was sort of like recently doing the festival circuit. Uh, I'm not sure if it is acquirable yet, um, but keep an eye on the, the Beaver Believers, wonderful documentary. Um, and then, you know, I think that for anybody interested in, 
you know, in beaver coexistence, you know, if you're out there and you've got, you know, a, a beaver plugging up your, uh, you know, the, the culvert that goes under your driveway or, or what have you, or a beaver cutting down your, you know, your apple trees, check out um, uh, the Beaver Institute. That's beaverinstitute.org. Uh, and they'll, that, that page has lots of resources about beaver coexistence, uh, links to beaver research, um, all kinds of all kinds of good stuff. Um, so the, yeah, the Beaver Institute is really cool. Um, and then you know, and then and then local local to you all, you know, the the Tulalip Beaver Project, uh, which is operated by the Tulalip Tribe. Um, you know, they've got a, a really nice website as well, and uh, a lot of good beaver resources. So that's you know, if if you if there's a you know if there's a beaver that requires relocation in, in your part of the state, it's probably the Tulalip who are going to be doing it. So so keep an eye on on those as well. Particularly fascinating how you blended just these two things, history and, and kind of looking into their, their, um, their kind of just looking through records. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Of just yeah. how, to, I mean, how do you just like, go and look for beavers in people's writings and yeah. just research, I guess, your research? Yeah, you know, I mean, there, you know, there, there's, you know, it's been, there's been a lot written about, the, written about the fur trade historically, so that was helpful. But you know, what was really helpful for me was, um, so you know, as you mentioned, when you gave that very um, generous biography of me, you know, I, I uh, you know, I, I went to the Yale School of Forestry, and then my, my wife went to the uh, the Yale School of Nursing. So uh, you know, we were, we were living in New Haven um, for a lot of the writing of this of this book, uh, and you know, Yale University, this you know, kind of randomly, this Eastern University has the world's second largest collection of kind of Western American history. Um, and it's got all of these, you know, it's got, it has some, the library has some wonderful curators uh, who really, you know, know their stuff. And, uh, you know, so I basically went in there and I said, you know, hey, I would love to read the journals of, you know, trappers, explorers, railroad surveyors, whoever, um, who, you know, were, who would have been the first white people to experience this fully beavered landscape and, and you know, and who could maybe testify uh, to what it looked like. And, you know, it was, it was so cool. I mean, they, you know, they, they uh, brought out, you know, like you, you ask for a, you know, you ask for a, some material and they bring out this, like this dusty box uh, of, you know, <laughs> of, of like crumbling yellowed paper that was written in, you know, in, in 1823. Um, and uh, it was just, it was, it was incredible. And there were some really, you know, just wonderful, uh, amazing historical observations in there. And, and that was just uh, so, so valuable. So, you know, I, I feel like uh, I really leaned heavily uh, on, on, a, on a library uh, and, you know, and, and probably couldn't have written this, uh, this book without, without them. And that's, you know, that's what's been so frustrating this year. I'm, you know, I'm working on my next book and, um, you know, not, I mean, I, of course, like some of this, some of this material is available uh, remotely through interlibrary loan. Um, but, you know, for the most part, um, you know, my, my sort of in-person library research has been really curtailed and that's, that's a, that's a, a, a bummer. So I, I miss, I miss the Spokane Public Library and I can't yes. wait to be open. Mm -hmm. So what's next? What's the next book about? Yes, yeah, so the next book is about, it's about this, the science of road ecology, which is basically how roads impact nature and, and how we can kind of manage those impacts and create landscapes that are, are friendlier for wildlife. So, you know, if, you, if you've, uh, you know, driven over Snoqualmie Pass and, you know, and, and gone under that giant wildlife bridge um, up, by the, up by the pass there. Oh, that is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the sort of project that I'll be I'll be writing about is you know how do we, you know how do we build those things? Where do we put them? What species do we benefit? How do different you know different kinds of sort of landscape or, or infrastructural modifications help different species? Um, yeah, so that uh, so that that's a work in progress, and uh, hopefully that'll come out um, yeah, maybe in early twenty twenty two. Well, we certainly thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. And I, I mean, I was fascinated. I, I want to go <laughs> look up some more with the kids. And we're going to be looking for Beaver Believers, which I think is the best name ever. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for joining us and being with us on our tiny, tiny island via, uh, via Zoom. We certainly appreciate it. And thank you. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great pleasure, and uh, I love the San Juan. So I'm, hope, I'm hoping I can I can visit you guys when the, uh, when the world us. returns to some semblance of normal. Come visit us. Come look at your book in here. It's here, of course, you know. But I'm, I'm on her. thank you. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll be checked out. That's what you want. <laughs> all so, right. Good night. Good night, uh, everybody. Good night. Thank you all.